Good morning, everybody. Um, I, my name is Phil Grebe. I am one of the pastors here. And it occurred to me this week that it's been 50 years since I became a Christian this summer. Um, it was in a... Thank you. It was something the Lord did, not me. I had no intention of, you know, giving my life to Christ. But... Um, but it happened, and it happened in a small Baptist church um, here in Castor Valley in the basement where a group of hippies, to be honest, were, um, were meeting every Thursday night, and they, there was just an energy there that was different from anything that I ever saw. Um, something captured my imagination. Something captured me. And I understand now that it's the Holy Spirit that did that. But at the time, I was like, it's like a cloud. Just this feeling that was very intense and very cool. And I have found that over the years, God has been faithful to me as I have been trying to follow God. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about the discipline of witness. So when I was at that Baptist church, witness was something you did, right? You um, witnessed two people. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are called that because they go out and they witness two people. They share Christ. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between what I mean by the verb witness and the noun witness. So I think that there is both, but I think that we are called to be witnesses, not to just go out and talk, but to, um, but to actually be people who witness. I want to tell you about an incident that happened when I was in college. There was a group of people who were standing in front of the center of, of my university who were they had American flags behind them, and they were talking really loudly. Turn or burn is what their main message was. Either you repent or you will burn in hell forever. And there were, there were people, you know, in a, in a liberal university, there are people there who like to disagree and will stand up there and argue with people. And there were a whole bunch of people up in the front kind of um, harassing the people that were doing the preaching, and the preaching people were harassing the others. But as I looked around, there was a fairly large crowd, and around the edges of the, of the crowd were people I knew from the Christian group that I was a part of. And they were all kind of, you could see them all kind of going, this is, you know, just talking very quietly to whoever they were with. And there were all these pairs of people. Um, they were being people who were faithful to Jesus and talking to their friends, the, the friends that they were with were for the most part non-Christians. It wasn't something that was planned, but it was something that was going on. It was God working in people's hearts. A few days ago, a few weeks ago actually, I was talking to a friend of mine, um, and this friend of mine and another friend meet together every Monday for for math, to be honest. We, I, I know it's not a thing, but we gather together and we do, we're working through a book on inequalities right now. And we were, we were all uh, math teachers at one point. We're all retired now. And so we do math for fun. Okay, laugh. Thank you. Um, this friend of mine, uh, this one friend, is a very staunch atheist. And, and he and I have a lot of conversations about things, but mostly when it starts getting into an area that he deems religious, he will kind of shut me down, not allow me to say anything. And usually, uh, you know, I don't say a lot because I know how he feels about it. Um, but on this day, he came in and he said, his first words to me was, humanity is doomed. We are going to die. 
And this was uh, during the heat waves back east and, and all of that. And I didn't disagree with him. We are all going to die. Um, but he is at a point where he has no hope. He has no hope for, uh, for the earth. He has no hope for any reconciliation between various groups. He has no hope for anything. We are doomed, he said. And as I came away from that, I was thinking, well, how, what, what can I say to that? He's right. We are doomed. He went on to talk about what he thought about humans and their self-destructive tendencies. I wasn't sure what had inspired all of this, but probably, you know, watching the news shows that he watches and um, looking at the world and being really a concerned human being for other people's um, lives and for other people, he, 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 his, his general attitude was the first time I'd ever heard it as being just totally, totally hopeless. So this morning I want us to start with what brings you hope? What is it that you see around you? I want you to think about this for a minute. What brings you hope? Anybody have any response to that? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. What else? Random acts of kindness. Okay. Yeah. The sun rising in the morning. That, that does give me hope, for sure. Mary? your faith, my children, my family. There are lots of things that bring us hope. Um, I'm sure that we all have a lot of them. Where does my hope come from? Where does my view of the world come from that gives me hope? And for me, for 50 years, it's been in Jesus. That's the center of my hope, the center of my... Now, let me stop here and just think about what I mean by hope. I don't mean optimism, like the world is great. No, we're all dying. The world is going to end at some point, right? Whether we destroy it or something else does. So looking ahead to things may not give me hope. What I have hope in is this, that in Jesus, God has brought salvation to this world. That is, God is going to fix it. God is going to change it. And God is in the process of changing it as we live. My hope is that that'll happen soon, as I'm sure it's all of yours. God calls us to live hopefully in the midst of all the pain and all the hurts of the world, not to give some kind of blind optimism, but to point to where our hope comes from. To bring hope means that I share my source. Um, I need to be a witness. And when I, like I said, when I first learned that word in a small Baptist church, it was about doing witnessing, standing on the street corner and preaching the gospel, or sharing Jesus with my friends and, and family. And I did that, and I did do witnessing a little bit, but I like this definition that I heard the other day. It didn't come from a, from a Christian source, it came from a secular source. In journalism, uh, somebody was talking on NPR to a journalist, who was talking about uh, what the job of a journalist is. Now, think about what a journalist does, right? They go to places, they see things, they write them down, or they speak them into a microphone, or they share them on TV, 
and they're describing the things that they've seen, what they've, who they've talked to, what they've experienced, yes? So we are like journalists as Christians, as followers of Jesus. And we'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. But what she meant about what a journalist does, she said there are three things. They bring agency, they bring dignity, and they bring hope. Those three things are what a journalist's job is. Agency. So what is agency? Agency means um, uh, the willingness to see others having the freedom to choose direction for their lives. The willingness to see others having direction and choosing to, being able to choose the direction in their lives. It's not just that we give them agency, right? We allow them to have the agency. We don't come in and say, this is what you should be doing. Journalists are there to observe and to help people have the agency to speak out, right? To have the ability to speak out. Um, dignity. Dignity is self-respect. It's honor, right? So they, it's the ability to give honor to people, to say, yes, you are a valuable person. As followers of Jesus, we know that all people are children of God, and that, that gives them dignity. It gives them, we need to give them respect. And hope, hope is the sense of living with a sense of purpose and working to better the world. So if you think about what it is that we do as witnesses, is we are bringing these three things to people all across the world. And you can see Jesus doing this throughout his life. But before we look at what Jesus said about witnessing, we're going to look at what the Old Testament says about witnessing. I love the Old Testament. I don't know if you guys know that yet. But I love to go into the Old Testament to pick out things that are just amazing. We're there tonight, today, in um, Isaiah 43, verses 8 through 10. So if you have a Bible on your app or wherever, uh, you might look that up. It's Isaiah 43, verses 8 through 10. Oh, so, through 13, I'm sorry, through 13, yeah. Um, before we begin, let me tell you a little bit of introduction about what's going on here. Um, this is about halfway through the book, and at the very beginning, God calls Isaiah in chapter 6. And Isaiah is completely confounded, but he volunteers for the job, right? God says, who shall I send to this people? And Isaiah raises his hand and says, send me. Here I am, send me. And so God says, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to people who have eyes but don't see. You're going to people who are deaf but can't hear. And you're going to preach to them in such a way that they will not understand. They will not hear. They will be blind. Because otherwise they'd repent. Jesus uses the same phrase in, um, in a couple of verses in the New Testament. And so here in Isaiah 43, you're going to see the same phrase. Here it is. Bring out the people who are blind, even though they have eyes, and the deaf, even though they have ears, a direct um, hyperlink to those verses in chapter 6. Bring out the people who are blind, even though they have eyes, and the deaf, even though they have ears. That is my nation. All the nations have gathered together so that the peoples may be assembled. Who among them can declare this and proclaim to us the former things? Let them present their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is true. So I want you to picture a courtroom. Here is God. Um, maybe on the bench, maybe being an attorney. On the one hand are his people who can't see and can't hear. On the other side are the peoples of the world 
that are the jury looking on as God has this conversation. Who can I send as my witnesses? Implication is my people are deaf and they can't see, so they don't understand. And then he says to them, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may understand, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there was no strange God among you. So you, my deaf and blind people, are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Even from eternity, I am him, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? So it's God who comes and witnesses to who God is, right? That God is the all-powerful, that God is the one with strength and power, and God is the one who will save. Now, there's a reference to other gods in there, and part of the problem of the people of Israel at the time was that they had rejected God to go and serve other gods, making them blind and deaf. They had rejected who God was, and so they are the ones who need to hear that there is only one God. There was none before me. There are none after me. I am God, he says. So God calls Isaiah to be the prophet and these people to be the witnesses. And how can they be witnesses if they're blind and deaf? What is it that we are? How are we blind and deaf? What is it that we're not hearing? What is it that we are not seeing? So often in church, we ignore the gospel. We ignore who Jesus is and what Jesus said to do. Um, The people of Israel knew who God was, knew that God had taken them out of Egypt, knew that God had uh, given them land, knew that they were not doing it well, and knew that they were about to be sent to Babylon. They knew all of this, and yet they continued living the way they were living. So one of the things that is important to understand is what God is asking them to do is very simple. I want you to see me. I want you to hear me. I want you to know who I am. Listen again to what he says. He says... Who are, um, it is I who have declared and sa- saved and proclaimed, and there was no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses. You have seen this. There is no strange God among you. It is just God. Years ago, um, Elizabeth Elliot, who was a missionary in Ecuador, was sitting in a small room in this village, and there were people around her And she came across this verse because she couldn't figure out, she didn't know the language, she couldn't figure out how to communicate with these people. And what she realized was that God was calling her to know God, to be with God, to understand who God was. And that was it. That the saving peace, the peace that, you know, we talk about, you know, going out and witnessing so people can be saved, that part is God's part. Our job is to know and acknowledge who God is. So, let's turn to the New Testament. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Here's the second scripture. It's our New Testament reading for this morning, if you will. Gathering them together, gathering the apostles, as uh, Phil was talking about, He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
So, wait. Sit. Don't do anything. Right? Just wait. So when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. That is, we are living in the end times. Did you know that? We're living in the end times? They began when Jesus ascended to heaven. Or they began when Jesus was born. But we are living in the end times. All of this are, is, is the end times. And so when Jesus says this, it's, it could happen any time that God will return. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Uh, keep that word in mind, power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes among you. And you shall be my witnesses. What did God say to the people in Isaiah? You are my witnesses. What does Jesus say? You are my witnesses. It is not something you do. It is something you are. As a follower of Jesus, that's what you are. You will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The remotest part of the earth. Christianity has been spreading ever since. When the Holy Spirit came upon them in chapter 2 in Acts, all the way through to now and even beyond. So the first part of being a witness is knowing God and understanding him as much as we can and following God. The second part is this piece, being a witness, going and telling. So there's a difference between being a witness and being a witness in the biblical sense, and that is that word power. Um, journalists go out every day and go all over the place and tell the stories of what are going on. That's being a witness. Being a biblical witness is going out in power, seeing things through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, looking at how this world is dying and realizing that we, as witnesses, are ones who are called to bring in life, right? By the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us life. We are called to go out and give life to others. So the first part is knowing the gospel, being able to share who Jesus is. And the second part is looking at things um, in a way that Paul describes as this. Here's the gospel, or at least part of the gospel. Now all these things are from God who reconciled himself, us to himself, through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That word, you are loved by God. He sent his son so that you can know that. Share it um, in the world. Now, the last thing I want to say about being a witness, and then we'll talk about what the practice looks like. Uh, the last thing I want to say about this is being a witness is dangerous, right? Um, it is not easy. In the great chapter of Hebrews, the uh, chapter 11, that is the, you know, the list of all these saints and prophets and people who have gone before, we read those names, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and on and on, right? But often we don't look at the end of this. And I want to read just the end of that chapter because it doesn't sound all that happy. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Okay, that's good. And others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword,
They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Wait a minute. Sawn in two? Um, stoned? Destitute? Ill-treated? What is this? Despite what we hear and often think, in fact, it is hard, requires discipline, and brings often hardship and misery, very possibly never seeing the fruit of our labor, but bringing hope to the world that is important. A few weeks ago, well, a few months ago, January, February, I was teaching um, for the first time since 2019 uh, in a class in Alameda, and a former student of mine came into the room. Um, she, I had had her back in 1982, 83, something like that. Um, she was a junior high kid. Um, I've kept up with her on Facebook. Um, but she came in, and she was talking about what she was doing and why she was there, and and all of this stuff, and so we caught up. And she said, you know, I look on Facebook and I see that you write things about having faith and, and, and all of that. She said, you know, I, I, I always wondered why, uh, why you were such a good teacher, why you, were, why you taught us the way you did. And she said, now I understand. And the implication was that something in my life was showing forth the light of Jesus. And I don't know, I don't know what I did. Um, it, it wasn't intentional. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit in me that gives me that power in a classroom, in a secular setting. Without speaking the name of Jesus, she knew what was going on. And others have told me that as well. So how do, you, how do you get to this point where your life is showing the light of Jesus? Uh, there's a couple of things that you can do to practice being a witness. The first one, I think, is, is the most important. At some point this week, write out the story of your journey of faith. How has the good news of Jesus changed your life? How have you seen the work of God in your life? Now, we had for many years a um, children's director who talked about God sightings. Many of you remember her. And so another thing that you can do is sit down and write out where you've seen God work in the last week, in the last month, in the last few days, in the last hour. Write these things down to remember them Remembering is a theme throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Remember who you are. Write down places where you've seen God working. So how does your life reflect God's presence in you? Are you living in hope? Or are you like my friend who is hopeless? What is the good news of the gospel? Do you know it as good news? Is it a religious thing that's kind of there, or is it something that you have lived and are living today? Think about how you practice your faith as you walk every day. And then, what you may want to do, if you want, if you want to do this, is practice with another person about how you can tell your story um, and within the story of the gospel. Now, last week we had a musical presentation, right, by Michael, Erna, Michael Kim Eubanks. And his presentation was, in my brain, just an amazing story. Because what did he begin with? God putting their hands in the, in the mud <clears throat> and forming humans out of, out of the mud. And then he talked about the destructiveness of the world even to, uh, to the destructiveness of Christ on the cross. But then he talked about living in the house of God at the end. 
It was the story of the gospel. It was the sto- his, his story of the gospel. That is, things that he knew and experienced, that he was reacting to, but also within the wider context of what God has done in this world and what God is doing in this world. It's a, a very rare kind of thing when people can do that, whether in music or not. But it's a good idea to try to sit down and write out your story, what God has done in your life, and then how that fits into the wider picture of what God is doing in the world. So, practice, read and study the Gospels if you don't know the story very well. Um, Get into a group, a community group that is doing Bible study. Uh, It's good to be in those places. And then live your life as somebody who is a follower of Jesus. Amen? Amen? All right. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you for your Holy Spirit in us who leads and guides and guards our steps as we walk. Help us this week to walk with you as living witnesses of your love and your grace and your hope. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.